Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jaco van der Kooy. I'm Dutch, youngest of eight. Farmer's family, a little bit of uh, from the south of the Netherlands. And you know, one of the things that, that you know, like I'm going to share with you today is some of the best practices I learned. But you have to put that in a little bit in a perspective. Okay? You have to understand that as the youngest of eight, what I used to do all the way up till 22, 23 years old was fry french fries. My family didn't have a very glamorous one. It was just frying french fries in the store. They lost that store over time, and then you know, I started doing it for you know, other friends and, uh, that we became as a work, as a summer job, creating milkshakes and frying, uh, frying french fries. That is the, where I'm coming from. I learned and went, uh, went onward with a company called Philips that took me around the world, and I landed in a spot called Silicon Valley by somewhat of accident. And what I saw there were some really, really great things, some really, really bad things, but I saw that there was a huge disconnect. Today I'm going to help you, so, you know, cover that, that disconnect. I'm going to first start with you, is, and I'm going to first, maybe you can help me a little bit. I want, uh, you know, whoever has that ability, ask me a question about my background and ask me a question what you want to know about me, about my ideas on sales and so on. Please, a question now, otherwise I'll ping somebody from the audience. I'm really decent at it. I'm going to come into that. So pick a person. What do you want to know from me? There's a reason I'm asking you for this. Yes, a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Man, what would you like to know from me? Um, what's the relationship between French fries and sales? What is the relationship between French fries and sales? That relationship is communication with your customers. Whenever you sell, you've got to communicate with your customers. Next one up. Lady, what would you like to know from me? I'm about to start sharing some experiences with you. You need to know something about me. What do you need to know? What value am I going to give you? I'm going to give you knowledge on real practical situations. I think there's always a lot of strategy, but today we want to know a little bit. We're going to go really practical. Okay, last one up, gentlemen. Uh, I've heard you speak before. What oh. can I say that's new today? <laughs> Dependent on what you like. Um, why don't you tell us at the end what was new today? Would that be okay? Okay. The reason why I'm asking you for this is the following. What you will run into in many of these, these groups is you will run into people who are sharing best practices with you. And some of you may take those best practices and go back and implement them and think to yourself, that is now the law. And you've got to be very, very careful with this. There approximately are three really different kind of people that talk in front of you. A person who has never done it, but read about it in a blog post, may have blogged about it, may have even written a book about it, but actually has never done it. Okay? We need to know if that person talks to us. Doesn't mean that that person doesn't have great information, not at all. It just means you need to know that. Do you speak from personal experience or are you creating anecdotes from what you've heard at other conferences? Second, a person who has done it once or twice, commonly a VP of sales or a CEO. Again, super valuable information. They have done it before you and you need to listen to that. But the thing is, they've only done it once or twice. And what worked for them may not work for other people. And then, and I'll, I'll put me into, myself into that category, and I own up to that over the next couple, 20, 25 minutes. You have experts. We do this again and again and again and again. We keep doing this. We see the patterns. That doesn't mean that we're exactly a specialist in the market, but we often know, like, okay, this business works like that. That business works like this. We see the patterns. If you do not know who is giving you that counsel, and if you don't know what the differences are, you may mistake the first one for the third one, and that is a very valuable difference. So always in today's world, question, who am I taking advice and counsel from in this setting or from a blog post? Beware. And all people have something to contribute, but beware. Make sense? Give you a few uh, pointers. Largest deal I personally closed, $52 million. That was a deal I did. Uh, uh, we call, and for that, we use what a technique, which you nowadays would refer to as challenger selling. 
channels that you probably well know of is BT. I use BT in order to sell Contiki software, pretty much the, the, the one that you uh, referred to as the, uh, the old BBC player. Uh, that was based on Contiki software that we sold to BB BBC, Channel 4, IT, V, and so on. So that pretty much everybody down here used that. Consumer industry, you'll see in, in, um, over in the US, we worked a lot with like companies like Dish, DirecTV, Warner Brothers, Disney, and so on. That is where my experience comes from. Going into the Bay Area and starting to work for startups, I became a VP of sales. I worked for seven VPs of sales, seven before I became one, in a slot of three years. We were rotating VPs of sales as fast as we were missing and hitting quotas. I've been, I uh, apologize for the bad word, I don't know what, the, what is a good word for screwed, that is not screwed that I can say on stage. Fail. Fail. No, no. I got, okay, screw it, <laughs> screw it. <laughs> I got screwed over by CEOs out of packages who didn't give me uh, a promotion at a certain point in time where they was clearly committed only to come to the conclusion that that resulted in me missing out on a million dollars during the acquisition. For those of you who you know, like, uh, understand stock options, I ran the portfolio, I run it today. We are among others representing Notion and, and their portfolio companies. We help them, but we also help companies storm portfolio like Pipedrive this morning. We help, we coach them on what we call go-to market strategies. And here's what we see go wrong. Folks in general do not understand that the world has changed. And it has changed radically. And so what we do, we generally take on many companies start saying, hey, what do I do? I need to start selling. I need a new VP of sales. Bring in a VP of sales. And the VP of sales starts working. And as they work, they start hiring people, establish a comp plan, establish quota, uh, get the tooling, get a good CRM in. And so slowly but surely, this thing starts to take shape. And generally, it is you know, not very well thought out. It's just put together with the best intentions by hardworking people. Unfortunately, it mimics building a 20-story building on top of a one garage foundation. It was never meant to build that big. And these things collapse on top of each other, often at the cost of the VP of sales. In that, they're taking a round of funding with them, devaluation of the company, and so on. Now, some of you might go like, oh, that doesn't happen to us. In essence, that happens to nine out of 10 companies. Whatever you're comfortable with, it happens to a lot of companies. We need to rethink that. So I'm going to give you a few pointers on why things have changed so much. First of all, my experience today is primarily based on ACVs in the range of up to $100,000. Recurring revenue a year, um, volume-based sales. We're looking at at least doing like five or 10 deals a month. Uh, low as I can go is three. If you are cutting deals, 250K, once a quarter per salesperson, you're doing a few key accounts a year, much of this doesn't apply to this to you, okay? That is deep enterprise selling, that is in a different direction. Whether you sell 250K under a recurring revenue, that doesn't make you necessarily a SaaS, a, a hyper-growth, high-velocity SaaS company. SaaS business is based on three things. Number one, you probably need to have your software in the cloud. <laughs> I say this because some people are shifting servers right now and call it, you know, we're, we're a cloud company. Like, no, no, that's not what software as a service was intended. It is something that is different, and you always see the recurrence of it, but it's not SaaS. SaaS number one is, I gotta serve my software in the cloud. Number two, as I serve it, I don't provide a, a lot of value, a, a price up front. I'm gonna draw this, uh, this out here, and we're gonna call it the sas meter In the sas meter on the left, I'm having the perpetual hardware and software sales, three-year contracts, long-term selling, okay? Customer buys it, pays it, 30 days later, some form of money in the bank, salesperson, 30 days later, drives a BMW off the lot, right? That, is, that sits here, perpetual. If I go into the middle down here, I'm sitting in SaaS. In the SaaS industry, what do we see? Recurring revenue streams, dollar value is split up. If I go further to the right, I'm going SaaS monthly. This down here is annually. And down here, we have a category that is developing rapidly, SaaS, two to three years. Now, the two to year, three year contracts are starting to develop with companies who are making a big upfront commitment, so just installing the SaaS service is no longer just installing like a little, you know, like a Chrome plug, and it essentially means some activity needs to take place. 
These companies want to strike two to three year contracts. Government, as they are starting to buy SaaS sales, SaaS services, they buy under two to three year contracts. If I draw this analogy, down here, I am buying a car. What would the analogy be of this? If I buy a car, what would be the analogy of a SaaS service be? A lease? If I go further to the right, what is the next analogy? Lease on a shorter term. Rent. A zip car sits in there too, right? So rent. And, you know, like zip car, I could, you know, like dependent on whether it's by hour and so on. But rent sits here. What sits here? Uber. Taxi. And we can argue, and it's a great conversation to have, does Uber sit here and then a taxi, or does a taxi sit here? Um, which one is lower to the, to the right? What we see on the left, people buy value. If I buy hardware, I do not get the impact of that 30 days later. If I buy $12 million worth of Cisco gear, it's going to take a while for that is installed, you know, simulated inside, the, inside the, the network. So when I buy, is I buy the promise from you that, hey, if you buy the service, you're going to get this great impact. Very common in enterprise selling. We even call that, if we sell it to you, we call it the value proposal with a three-year return on investment or a five-year return on investment. However, on the right, something different happens, right? Down here, I'm now you know, starting to buy here the, 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 the software. Down here, I'm starting to get it monthly. There's one in here, sub monthly subscription model. Down here, something special happens. What am I buying here on the right in the world of software as a service? If I go further to the right, where do I end up with? Instant service, pay-per-view, usage, and so on. So I'm going down here, one above, and I'm buying usage. Okay? There's one more. The next one is impact. I'm essentially not only buying usage, I'm buying from you results. For example, the ad industry, like companies like AdRoll, live in this market. Hey, thank you for your million dollar insertion order. There's nothing I can do with it until the ad gets served, and then I start recognizing it. I'm actually buying the impact. This is what you see when you experience Uber. You're not buying a subscription of having a car available. Uh, Dutsky, I just need to go from point A, and I'll pay you when I get to point B. Right? You're buying the impact. In this world, something radical has changed. If I buy product between the risk of the buyer, how high is the risk on the buyer on this side? Hi, you're going to get fired if you buy the wrong $12 million worth of equipment. What is the risk of the seller? Nothing. Jaco can sell ice to Eskimos. You got to see what he got. The dude, man, he just sold $12 million worth of, of gear. They're not even using it. They're using it as door stoppers. That dude is a rainmaker. Awesome. Imagine you live in that world today. That on Twitter would chase you back and would, on some social media, annihilate your reputation overnight. Yet, 10, 15, 20 years ago, that's how enterprise sales was done. That was what, it was, what happened. We call these folks rainmakers. Could sell anything to anyone. Now, in today's world, I'm sitting on the other side. What is the risk of the buyer on this side, and what is the risk of the seller? It reversed. The seller now carries most of the risk, and the buyer carries hardly any risk. This risk pattern that has shifted has essentially shifted the entire valuation of companies and how they're selling. We just never changed that. We just fall to ourselves like, look, you know, just keep selling. You see this because I can tell you right now, if I look at your comp plan, it will be rare that I see a comp plan that is not simil shows similarities to what the comp plan was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And if I see how your recruiter works, your recruiter has not sitting in here and sitting here like, oh, this changed. I need to hire different people. No, none of that. We're hiring the same people. We're compensating them approximately the same. We're running approximately the same VP of sales, and generally an alpha, who is trying to create this competitive behavior. We even call the person who contributed individual contributors. And that is the problem that we are facing. Today I'm going to demonstrate to you very briefly to you in this that what was wrong with all this 
is that we never understood it and therefore we built the wrong model under the wrong assumptions. We just rolled into it. Now, for the past 10, 50 years, we were benefiting from what we call a value proposition based on a challenger sale that was so good that the seller, the buyer actually didn't care. The value prop was very simple over the past decade. So if I hear you right, Jaco, I just had the financial crash in 2008. <laughs> I'm about to place a $3 million purchase order with an SAP, an Oracle, and you're telling me since you're Salesforce that you can sell me the same product and service for $5,000 a month. Yes, I buy you. Why? Because my CapEx just got wiped out post-2008. Post-2008, CapEx budgets got wiped out, nobody had CapEx anymore, so everybody had only one thing to buy, like I still need my software, and lo and behold, SaaS was ready, got matured in the previous year, rolled out, and in America, boom! fell straight into a, 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 a ground of, of, of saturated material. What we had to do simply was using low-cost resources, today you would refer to them as SDRs, AEs, two-stage sales organization, rolling through, picking up the phone, quickly setting up a meeting, meeting gets handed over, and, we, and all the, the sales pitch was, we sell the same as major software vendor at OPEX budget instead of CAPEX budget. You would be, f if you're a C-level officer, you would be fired if you wouldn't take that call at that point in time. I'm oversimplifying, there's always ifs and hows and stuff like that. This is what fueled the company. So what tools were needed to make this really successful? Oh, you know what? We probably need some, some marketing software that can get the word out. Which company? Eloqua Marketo. We probably need companies that we can um, start inside selling. Oh, we have a whole bunch of inside sales organizations and uh, software programs. And so suddenly all the tools that were supporting that started to flourish and to flourish. Yet today, and what we've now seen, is that model has fallen on its sword. Two-stage sales organizations with large-scale SDRs organizations no longer work. The CapEx over OpEx, everybody knows SaaS. You don't have to convince the CEO anymore, CTO, CMO that they need to go. And so the use of an uneducated, least knowledgeable person into your organization, SDR, as the first point of contact with your customer, no longer works. There are exceptions, always, but the exceptions are no longer the norm, they were the norm previously. What I'm gonna show you, and I'm gonna describe to you, is the difference between correlation and causation. Correlation means shark attacks are up and ice cream sales are up. They're not connected, they're correlated because the weather is hot. People go to the beach, therefore one correlates with the other. Causation means that one causes the other point of view today, most sales organizations are correlation based. I'm going to depict that in a simple, I'm going to, I'm going to need some help. And that help what I'm going to need is, um, I see a few uh, women in the, the audience, so get, if the women could you know, pull out your iPhone, I need you to help me calculate. I'm going to give you the, the women calculation, so I see at least one, two, three. So you need to help me and then I need a few guys who does, do the same calculation. We're going to take 1,000 leads, just in this case we're using an inbound model. On that, I'm going to convert on a conversion rate and I'll pick 30%. I'm going to change the conversion rate to, which is to the next one, at 20%. I'm going to create a win rate, call it one in five. I'm going to close at a price of, let's say, $15,000. Let's keep it at that, I can go further, but let's keep it at that. So, if I, if I generate this, calculate out to me how much annual recurring revenue this would create. This is an annual contract value. 30%, 20%, 20%, 50, times 15,000, times 1,000. How much sales does that give me, give or take? While the ladies do that, oh, you're not, no, 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 Dutsky, you're not a lady. <laughs> but, I need you next. Can you help me on the next one? Okay. So now I'm going to take the same thousand leads, I'm going to make that 0 0.32, I'm going to make that 0 0.22, I'm going to win one in four and a half, so that, that needs to be two divided by nine, I, I have run into that, and I'm going to sell this, that's about 20% discount, and I'm going to sell this at $18,000, you calculate that one out. Okay. Ladies, what was the, the number on the first one? Say that again? 190K. 198? 180. Sorry, 180. 
Thank you. Somebody help me out here. Don't make me do it. Okay, so all times times uh, one divided by four and a half is times two divided by. Do the total. A thousand times point thirty two. Are you on it? Yeah. Okay. Did somebody else help him out? Two eight one. It's close enough. I don't know if the exact number, but it depicts it. Okay. I want to show you the following. Small changes, big impact. Few percentage points, big impact. This is just what happens before the sale. If we, pro if we start adding the metrics behind the sale, the churn, the upsell, the cross sell, and so on, this number starts to, to get even bigger. And what you quickly are going to see is that down here, you got double your sales in general with the other factors in between. Now, why is this? Where is this caused by? It is caused by that these numbers are multiplications of each other. And that is the problem that most organizations don't realize. If I ask, and if I go back to my life as a sales VP, and the person asks me, Jaco, you got a, you know, like an X million dollar quota, let's say a $10 million easy number quota, how are you going to meet it? I would go like, hmm. We're going to get like about one to two million dollars from BT. I'm going to get one to two million dollars from AT&T. So that puts me about between three and four. Then my superstar is going to bring me in about two million dollars on a big deal. So I'm about like somewhere around six. And then the rest of the team is going to do something around four million dollars. And they're going to close about five or ten deals. And what I, in essence, and then and then doing is I'm adding up numbers. I'm not multiplying. I'm adding up. If I ask a VP of marketing, hey, you generate a thousand leads for me, the VP of marketing is going to say, well, we're going to get 200 from this trade show, we're going to get 100 from this particular event, that particular asset is going to generate this amount of leads, and they start adding up. It's an additive culture. SaaS doesn't work like additive. SaaS works as a product. And that is the result, if we start multiplying, small changes start to compound on each other. And that is the trick that many organizations don't understand. Because I'm telling you, if I want to double my number, because my number is growing, then what most sales organizations will tell, they will look at marketing and say, can you double my, can you double my leads? I need more leads. And it was not the leads, the volume of leads that's a problem. Now, how do we make these changes is way more interesting. Because if I ask an SDR, and if I now put these numbers here down here, right? And I say like, hey, how are we going to increase? Hannah, can you make sure you keep me on time? So you, can you sit here and keep me, uh, uh, give me a countdown on the time? Because I get so passionate about this stuff that if I, this, as some of you have seen me in action, this is, it's not going to go well. OK, so what we see down here, this one is in generally marketing. Just one in generally is an SDR. These two in generally are the AE's responsibility and then generating you know, this amount of revenue, give or take. If I ask an SDR, can you improve from 0.22 conversion rate to 0.22, given the right tools and the bill, that is, seems to be a reasonable ask. If I ask them, they got to double create the amount of SQLs, they go like, whoa, 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 cannot do that. Small percentage point can be changed. Now what I can do is I can deploy a best practice on how to improve that. This product is, the thinking in product essentially moves us away from the artistic point of view where we normally looking at sales as an art. I got it. It's a black skill that I was given. I have no idea, but I was never given the black skills. I closed some of these big deals, but Dutsky's, it was not a black skill, okay? <laughs> I have never had a customer who sat, and I, you know, the, one of the last big contracts was a contract of Jeff Bezos' organization, Amazon, for a couple of million dollars. They didn't come up to me and say, Jocko, dude, excellent negotiation, superb. Your pitch, wonderful. You know what they say? You listened. You're the first person who listened. You're the first person who cared. You're the first person who actually took notes when I was talking. Because true sales is not just about negotiation. The, pre, the, the, the person who spoke this morning about negotiation, really valid points. In negotiation, those are valid points. We're trying to avoid all of that because it's the last thing that happened. Negotiation shouldn't be opposite side of the table. If I ask you, finish your, put another word next to negotiation, the most common word I hear is hostage negotiation. 
You're sitting on opposite side of the table. It's the wrong thing to do. You need to sit on the same side of the table. And as the gentleman correctly stated, it's about trading. I can tell you one thing. If you have a sales organization that, drive, that lives on about 20, 28, 29, 30, 32 year olds, and you need to teach them negotiation and avoiding discount, that most likely will not be a successful avenue. They're just not built that way. We sit on these calls, we listen to them. They enter negotiation, and the first thing they say is 20% discount. Like, what the? How do we get to tw from zero to 20? They're not skilled to this level of confrontation. So we say we need to change a few things. Let me show you a few of the things that we can change. In this journey, in this journey of, of in order to make this successful, we look back and we say, it's like, look, if I draw this as a, a form of a sales funnel, then in this sales funnel, what matters most to a customer are a few key moments. We don't need to helicopter our customers all through the first touch, last touch, every touch. Oh, they opened up slide four of the presentation. Get ready, something exciting is going to happen. They're on it, 25 seconds. Are you checking? 28, the new record. Like, dootskis, dootskis, shut the fuck up, right? Why are we doing this? This is not what we need to do. And so instead, what we say is like, look back on your life. Look back to 2017. And think to yourself, was it a great year or was it a bad year? If you think of yourself as a great year, then probably a baby was born, maybe a new lover came into your life. Um, uh, you know, like as some of the kids the other day that I spoke to, like, man, I, had a, I remember a steamy night of you know what. Like, that was really good in 2017. I'm like, yes, love it. I'm older, I don't recall anymore. <laughs> but I, you're, I rem they have unique moments. And these unique moments add up. And at the end of the day, they add up these few moments, and they go, like, it was a great year. I had a promotion, and so on and so forth. Likewise, if you are, hopefully you didn't lose a person that was beloved to you, you know, stuff like that, then make it a bad year. And it's okay, not every year needs to be a great year. What you're not doing is counting the days. I had 265 days that were awesome. I had about 12 days that were eh, and I had 88 days that were negative. You don't think about that. You only think about the moments that truly mattered. And so too does your customer. Here, I will give it to you the seven key moments that truly, truly matter to a customer. They're not comp that doesn't mean that they have to apply to everyone. Some of you may say, oh, we have a different moment. These are just generally the seven key moments. Moment number one, you need to reach out to your customers not because they're a fit, but because they have a pain. Most people reach out to customers because they're a fit. So if I ask them, why did you call, if we role play this out, why did you call me? Oh, I noticed that you are the title at the company size in a vertical industry that we sell to. Congratulations. Do you want a meeting? 50 minute meeting to job. Why in the world do I want to have a meeting? I was literally waking up this morning, I was looking at my diary, I'm like, yeah, I'm empty, let's get some meetings today, right? Nobody wants meetings, so that's not gonna happen. However, if you reach out to a customer who has a pain, and as I role played this earlier with a company called The Crew, reach out to them and say, I noticed that on your recent trade show that you were still doing leads manually, that you have four events coming up, and that one of them is gonna be the biggest event that you ever had. Then reach out to people who are a pain, not a fit. Second moment. Conversation, not qualification. First thing that we do in the SDR and AE, may I ask you, how big is your company? How many people are you in having sales? How many people do you have in marketing? In other words, how many seats do you have? I can tell you right now, I can band you, budget, authority, need, and timeline. I can do that online via my chat box. And for those of you who we sometimes test, it happens. I get an SDR on the phone, may I ask? Are you currently on, on Salesforce CRM? Yes, okay, they just wanna make sure they can sell to me, check. May I ask, how many seats are you looking for? Eight, okay, they're, right, they're qualifying me. Well, the problem with qualification is there's nothing in it for me as a buyer. I mean, there's a great value in it for the seller, but nothing for a buyer. Moment number two, don't qualify, have a conversation. Thank you for coming in today, what brought you in? Oh, you're looking for something, have a conversation. Number three, discovery not sales pitching. Prescription before diagnosis is malpractice, people. It's no longer allowed. So what we need to do, we need to ask our customers questions, learn about their business with the intent not to sell them, but with the intent to solve their problem. <laughs> because I can tell you, buyers today can smell that you're selling like a mile away. The first thing that we almost have to do in every training class is like, okay, who have you had training before? Oh. 
of we have to unwind a whole bunch of BS from you that you have no, absolutely no idea about. They all start selling, 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 selling. At any given point in time, they essentially sell. So you gotta stop that. You gotta diagnose, learn your customer, understand. Make a proper recommendation on what is right for them, not right for you. Do that and what is right for you will come to you. Fourth one, trade, not negotiate. The gentleman who discussed uh, negotiating hit the nail on the head. It's about trading, not negotiating. For those of you who operate a service, SaaS service, and you have a SaaS price, there is no discounting in SaaS service. It doesn't exist. The discount came from when I sold it to you for $3 million, like five years ago, and I'm giving it to you at $12,000 a month, a year, whatever it is right now. That's the discount, okay? Yeah, like, I don't know where you get the discount from. That doesn't mean I cannot adjust the price. It just simply means that I have to trade. Oh, I understand, yeah, so you, you're working with a budget, okay, but, okay, now may I ask, if, if, if I'm able to help you with the price uh, range that you have given, would you be able to, to, to introduce me in two other people that can benefit from our solution? Those are hot SQLs that are gonna come in, they're valuable to me, right? Immediately trade, can you introduce? And I didn't say, could you refer? Because refer instigates something of like, my coach after four years of blood, sweat and tears, he gave me a recommendation. This is not recommendations and referral. This is, do you know anyone else who can benefit from our service? Very specific words, but very much needed. Number, four key mo uh, number five key moment, orchestrate not kick off. Most of you install the service, and the first objective of the person in the customer success organization do the onboarding. Yet something ma magically changed. What changed was on Friday when we were discussing and trading the deal, you didn't want to lose leverage. That's why you didn't tell me all your budget. That's why you didn't tell me who I needed to talk to. On Monday, we're in it together, buddy. You and me. We're on the same goal right now. You're not successful, I'm not successful. That relationship has changed. If I then come to you and say, let me onboard you, Okay, well, it gets onboarded. What we need to do is, hey, look, let's get sit back together. I know you wanted to have this date. Well, that date was a little bit flexible. Uh, you know, we wanted to make sure what really is the date is X, Y, Z. Great. And actually, you know Johnny, he's actually a little bit of an, of, he's against you. We had to convince him. So you probably need to convince him. So suddenly you get all these new details. You need to get those. The deal has changed. The relationship has changed, and therefore you can redo the deal. Therefore, you need to orchestrate, not just do the onboarding. Number four, usage. We think it's about usage, but usage means it's for you. Oh, we have great usage. The usage doesn't mean anything for the customer. Usage is not like, oh, dude, how is, how's the product? Man, I got great usage out of it. Like, great, what does that mean? Customers want impact, not usage. Final moment, we talk about upsell. Cross-sell, essentially it's about growing together. How are we gonna grow together? When you talk to your customer, say, hey, are you ready to renew? Um, sure, I got value out of it. But when you talk to them, is, is there an area of growth? All these things seem to be primarily words, but I'm telling you, if it comes out of your mouth and you think about it, then you start doing it. Negotiating, closing, pitching, qualifying, those words are no longer valid in today's world of selling. Customers reject it, and when they recognize it in your behavior, they're done with it. Now, what I show and demonstrate down here is simply the one, a blue, uh, one of the blueprints. And in these blueprints, we see down here, how can we improve simply the discovery call? <coughs> Opening up of the call, where we listen to the tonation of someone's voice. Great, you want to talk about soccer? Talk about soccer. Your role during the opening of the call is understand which voice belongs to which person so you know who's the decision maker. So if that person speaks, that value may be more valuable. Also, we establish baseline. Is that per person very excited and they talk like me on Red Bull all the time? Then you don't know if the donation is up and down. You need to know what the donation of somebody is. So if it changes, you know something happened. Ace, appreciate you taking the time. Let me check with you. Are we still good for 30 minutes? Well, the end goal of today's call is if you see what you like, we would move forward with a demo. Does that sound like a good call? Great. Opening of the call. As we step through the agenda to achieve that end goal, we then go through a proper diagnosis. Situation progression, pain, some of you recognize this as spin selling. Following that situation, and this is where we are very different than spin selling, we say, so if I got it right, you currently have this problem, this, you currently have this situation, this situation causing you that problem. Did I get that right? Yes. Empathize. It's not the first I hear that. We hear this all the time. Then we go and say, like, now may I ask, you know, what, what kind of impact is this causing you? Layer one. I can also ask, may I ask, layer two, 
Um, we have seen other customers who have experienced this impact. Have you seen the same? Layers, a uh, sense of layers of question. How far are you going in? Number three. Well, it sounds like that you are losing money, increasing money, that this is a headache. Um, is there a particular date that you want this fixed by? For those of you who are just here for a trick, I'm going to give you the following sentence. It's going to change your forecast. Yes, I need this by January 15th. Here comes the response. What happens if you miss that date? That simple question will change the conversation. I'm going to say, what happens if you miss that date? It's a simple question. It starts a great conversation. In the end, I have that ability. I can say, okay, we have a solution for you. you know, blah, blah, blah. Do your thing, whatever it is. You wagon. I'll refer in, in lieu of time to, uh, to that to some of our online materials that essentially connect the next meeting. What we see down here, if I look back at CR3, which in this case was the win ratio, in order to do the win ratio, right, if I want to go from one to five to one to four and a half, this is a way of doing it. This we call a blueprint, and a blueprint is a way that we can start looking at it. Doesn't mean that it's holy, it's just a starting position. You want to improve it? Improve it. You have two salespeople talking to each other, listening to each other's call, analyzing where they're in, we're on point. What you see here today with technology like a refract, we can now listen to the call, we can determine where they are in the call, and we can see, did they open up the call correctly? No. And in most cases, as you probably will well know, people don't, they start closing way too late, and so on and so forth. And as they start to late, the whole problem starts to occur, decision maker leaves, deal goes dark, they come to us and say like, 20% of our deals goes dark, can you fix those? Yes, but we have gotta go back. We can't fix them because they're dark. Okay? As I close up, before I go there, let me give you an opportunity to ask a question. Anybody wants to ask a question? Yes, sir. Um, this entire thing about saying, oh, we had another customer experience this problem and that problem, uh, this may again be culture-based, but this can also make you come across as a leaky ship when it comes to confidentiality. So where's the line? Have a conversation. Care for your customer. Have the conversation. What you'll find is that if you ask that question straight up front, which is a common occurrence, that people go straight into too much detail. May I ask, how is your current workflow? Second question that comes out of their mouth. Right? You go like, um, who am I talking to? Like, why am I describing my entire workflow and what's wrong with it with you? Right? In that case, we generally say educate them. Use other scenarios first to prompt them. Saying, I've worked with other customers like you before, and what I've noticed is that in generally they have these three issues. Now, if I talk about these three issues, would that resonate with you? Yes. Now I prompted, I used a prompting situation in order to get them started. As soon as they know that, what, that I know what I'm talking about, more and more details are going to come out of this. Okay? Most of this came down to conversation, and conversation is a great way to start. If I look today in our world, and I say, do we need more doctors? Probably. I'm not a doctor, it will take me too long. Do we need more engineers, more apps? I do not know if that's what we need. Um, I think we have plenty of them, and I think we can always benefit from more. Again, I'm no longer an app developer. If I look around me, and not too far in my own country, the uh, United States right now, I clearly see that what we have as a problem is communication. The world's biggest problem is that people are talking on both sides and not listening to each other. Folks, all of you marketing and sales professionals, that is our forte. We are great communicators. We want to change the world. Let's change the way how we communicate. Let's stop selling to customer and instead start listening as we ask them for questions. With that, I have two things. A, previous speaker left glasses. <laughs> and B, I do want to use the opportunity. Um, I have rarely seen this good of an event, this nicely organized, at this great of a location. So why don't we give a, start with uh, giving a great round of applause to James Key for the organizing.